In this Wheelseeker Pro training video, I'll be introducing anti-collision. We'll take a look at all the various inputs that affect anti-collision and the different outputs available within the software. So the first thing that we'll look at is the anti-collision settings, which can be accessed at operator level in the database tree. So within the database tree, I'm just going to right click at operator level and I'm going to select properties. This opens up the operator properties dialog and at the bottom of this dialog, we have our anti-collision settings. Now, these are incredibly important and it's very important that we have this set up correctly um, as we start entering in all of our information because this directly affects all of our anti-collision scanning. So it, this is a very, very important stage uh, of the process with regards to anti-collision. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the um, anti-collision settings that we have in here one at a time. We'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. So the first option that we've got is we have the scan method. So we've got four options available here. We've got 3D closest approach, which is the industry standard. And then we've got traveling cylinder, traveling cylinder north and horizontal scan. These different scan methods um, will obviously provide different outputs in terms of the anti-collision uh, report, in terms of things like the separation factor and the way that they're scanned. The most important thing to remember here is that if you are using the travelling cylinder plot, you have to have one of the two travelling cylinder methods selected. So travelling cylinder here, which would be relevant for high side if you're referencing high side, or travelling cylinder north if you are uh, referencing north um, within the travelling cylinder plot. So very important um, that, that you remember this. For the purposes of this example, we're going to have this selected to 3D closest approach, but we will have to come back and we will have to adjust this once we start using the, um, the travelling cylinder plot and we, we introduce that. Error surfaces. So, Error surfaces, we have got three different options in here. We've got the pedal curve, circular conic, and combined covariance. So pedal curve is, uh, is probably the most utilized one. Um, it's probably the industry standard within here. So this is the one that we will have selected for um, our example as well as we work through this. Warning type. So we have two options for warning type. The first one is error ratio. What you have selected in the warning type uh, drop down affects what we can see on the right hand side in the warnings section. And these warnings are the things that will be flagged in our anti collision report. Uh, they will also be flagged in our separation factor plot when we open it. So, this will, in this case, the error ratio relates to separation factor. So, these ratios that are entered here. Uh, are relevant to, to separation factors. So anything between uh, a separation factor of 2 and 1.5 will be flagged in the report and they will be flagged in the separation factor plot as a level 1 warning. Anything between 1.5 and 1 will be flagged as a level 2 and anything below 1 will be flagged as a level 3. Now everything in here is editable so you can change the warning name you can also change the value of the ratio in here. As a standard within the software, we have got a ratio of 2, 1.5 and 1 for these warning levels. But as a user, you can go in here and you can manually change this if you wish. So the second warning types that we have are rules-based. And we can see that when we have rules-based selected, it gives us two additional columns in here. So we have a type column and from the type column we have got some drop down options available. We have got error ratio, depth ratio and minimum centre to centre distance. So the error ratio is just exactly the same as our error ratio that we had selected here. So this is just um, separation factor values that we want to utilise and we want to flag if any of our scans land within these given values. For the depth ratio, what this means is, is that it means that it will flag, based on the information that we have entered, um, it will flag for 
a given center to center distance and this in this particular instance the center to center distance is calculated as a factor of our depth so if we just put um we'll put depth ratio in here as the name and we've got a ratio of 0 0.1 and what this means is that when the program runs the scan it will look at our measured depth and at any given calculation point, it will multiply the measured depth by our ratio, and that will form our center to center distance. And if our scan shows that we are closer to the offset well than the center to center distance, it will flag. So if we look at this example of point one and we say at 100 feet measured depth, um, that will give us a center to center distance of 10 feet. So if we were less than 10 feet away from any of our offset wells, we will flag as a depth ratio warning. In addition to this, we have the ability to enter in a maximum radius. So here we've entered a maximum radius of 10. And what this means is, is that we will follow the logic as we get deeper using a ratio. But once we get to the maximum radius, it doesn't matter how much deeper we get, the value will not get any bigger than the maximum radius. So here we put 10. So when we get to um, the point that we have hit center to center of 10, doesn't matter how much deeper we go, we will not get any larger than this um, maximum radius. We do not have to enter a value in here. We can leave this blank, in which case this will just follow this logic all the way to TDA of the well. And our last option in here is the minimum center to center distance. So in this case, if we were to put, for example, a 15 foot limit, we can then enter this in here. And in this case, we don't enter the 15 in the ratio column. We enter it in underneath the maximum radius. And this just shows us that um, it doesn't matter what depth we are, if we are within 15 feet of any given offset well, then this will basically flag up as our 15 foot limit. So this warning is the thing that will appear in our comments section of our um, anti-collision scan. The other thing to note in here is that we have some active cells. So this allows us to pick and choose the warnings that we want to utilize within a given scan. So we can have all of these active, or we can have just one or two or however many we wish. Uh, as long as it has a checkbox, as long as it has a tick in the checkbox, it will be utilized within the scan. If there is no check in the checkbox, then it will not be used within the scan. So at the moment, none of these would be used, but if I checked it down here, then it would only utilize these top three. For the purposes of our um, example, we're just going to use the top Three. We'll stick with the uh, with the error ratio in itself. The next thing that we'll look at is the error output at sigma. So, sigma level is our level of confidence that we have in our wellbore position. So, this directly affects the size of the ellipses of uncertainty which will be generated, which in turn has an effect on our anti-collision scan. The higher our sigma output value the larger our ellipses will be and the more confidence that we will have that our well our wellbore position so our survey point is somewhere within that ellipse um, this is fully editable two is industry standard and this is the value that uh, the software will always come with as a default but as a user you can go in here and you can change this to whatever value that you wish it to be but again, this is very important that you make sure that you enter this as the correct uh, value because, because it does affect the size of the ellipses, it also has a direct effect on your size of your separation factors and therefore your anti-collision. Our next option in the list is the casing. So within the software, we have the ability to either include casings or to not include casings. So if casings are included, then we have an option below where it says include casings and from the drop down we can choose to add or subtract and this is part of the, the calculation that's used when the separation factors are calculated. If this is selected as no 
then this option is greyed out and you're not able to select this at all. So uh, in our instance, we're going to have it selected as no. But if you do want them selected, you have to select yes before you will be able to select whether you're going to add or subtract your placings. The next option is where are our errors calculated from? So there are only two options in the drop down list. We have got surface and mudline. So surface is going to be used for uh, onshore wells. Mudline, if you are drilling offshore, you can select this and then your errors will only start calculating and accumulating from the mudline. So the final option we have in our anti-collision settings is the travelling cylinder plot safety factor. Within our travelling cylinder plot, we will generate ellipse of uncertainty around the reference well and around the offset well. And these will be added together and they will be displayed on the offset well. And this effectively represents our no-go zone. So when we are plotting on our travelling cylinder plot, we, would, we need to avoid that area to avoid our separation factor being 1. The travelling cylinder plot safety factor allows us to increase the size of the, this no-go zone based on our requirements. So when this is set at 1, it will just utilise the ellipses of uncertainty that have been created and it will just generate as you would normally expect with no additional safety factor. If, for example, we put this in as 1.2, then these ellipses will be 20% larger. Therefore, the no-go zone will be larger and therefore we will have less room to manoeuvre. But as long as you manage to avoid the no-go zone, you have incorporated this additional safety factor. The only plot, the only calculation that this affects is the travelling cylinder plot. Uh, if you're not utilising the travelling cylinder plot, then it makes no difference what value you've got in here. But as standard, it will be one. And if you require any additional safety taken into consideration, then this is where you should enter the value here. And this is something that we'll look at in a little bit more detail when we do look at the travelling cylinder plots. So once we've entered the information as we require it in here, all that we do is we would hit Apply, and then we would hit Close. Now that we have the anti-collision settings entered, the next important thing to consider is the plans and the surveys in the database, as these are a representation of our wells, and any errors made here will make the anti-collision outputs invalid. The first thing to consider is the coordinate reference system in the surface locations. If our wells don't start in the correct place, then our outputs will not be correct. So the coordinate reference system is accessed via the field properties. So if we right-click on the field properties level in the database tree, and select properties. Within the field properties dialog we can see our mapping grid option here which is a drop down menu with lots and lots of choices available. So it's very important to make sure that we select the correct option within this drop down menu and once this has been entered we then have the ability to enter either a grid easting and northing or a latitude and a longitude. Now whichever one we decide to enter the corresponding values will be automatically calculated based on the coordinate reference system selected and the values that we have entered. So it's very important that this is correctly selected and that we check that we've input these values. Once we've done this, we then double check that the output values are correct. If we're happy with that, then we know that we have got our surface location to tie in correctly. And we then have to make sure that we've got We've got a surface location for our field. We also have a facility location, which we will also want to double check. And then probably the most important one is down at the well properties level, because this is our wellhead. So it's very important, again, to check all three of these levels, just to ensure that the generated values, the calculated values here, and the input values are correct. And if these tie in, then we have the confidence that we're starting in the correct place. So our plan or our survey has the correct surface location. At facility and well properties level, there is also an option to enter the location uncertainty. So we can enter the vertical or the horizontal uncertainty based on our location measurement. So this is the uncertainty associated with the physical measurement of the surface location. 
and values entered here have an effect on the ellipse of uncertainty calculation and in turn the anti-collision. So if you have these values, this is where you would enter them. If you don't have these values, then you just leave this as zero and it will then not impact on your calculations. So the next thing that we would want to look at when we are entering our plan of the survey is to make sure that our tie on line and the last line of the plan of the survey ties in as we would expect it with the source. So if we've pulled this in from a compass export file or if we have manually copied this from a plan from somewhere else or we've pulled the surveys in from a, a survey listing that we have from somewhere else for an offset well, for example, we have to make sure that these values tie in specifically that the calculated values such as the TVD and the local coordinates for the north, south, east, west tie in because this will then give us the confidence that the survey or the plan that we have entered into the program is the same as the one that we have copied it from. So uh, again, it's just very, very good practice when you're pulling anything into the software or you're copying anything in that you double check that you've got the correct tie on line and you correct you check that the bottom line also ties in that then just means that we're confident that the plan or the survey is in correctly which is going to mean that when we run our anti-collision scans that's one thing we don't have to worry about we know that they're in the correct place where we expect them to be and the outputs that we're then going to get will be reflective of this so the next thing that we want to look at is going to be the magnetics and the way that we access the magnetics is either at plan level or at actual well level. So we'll right click at the plan level, we we'll select properties and we can see on the right hand side here we have our magnetics. Now the magnetics are important because these are used as part of the calculation for the ellipse of uncertainty. So uh, we want to make sure that these are in correctly and that way we have the confidence that our ellipses will be generating with all the relevant values entered correctly. So within this section we can choose from the drop down menu here and as standard the software comes with uh, IGRF and WMM models. Now when you select the relevant model you then select uh, the given date and based on the model selected and the date selected um, it will give you the, the relevant declination dip and total field strength for that given well for the given plan or for the given survey. We also have the ability to incorporate within the software BGGM and HDGM uh, geomagnetic models. Now these don't come as standard with the software but if you have the relevant license from either BGGM or HDGM then this is a file that you will be able to drop within a folder within the software and it will then be available for you to select from this drop down menu. In the situation where you have been given the values and you don't have the corresponding model you can enter the values in as user defined and this just allows you with user defined, these, the declination, the dip and the total field uh, cells will no longer be greyed out. As a user, you can then enter the values in here along with the date and these will be utilised uh, within the calcs. We can have multiple magnetics entered here, so it's also important that you select the relevant ones as the active because again, when we run the calculations within uh, in the background, it will use whichever one is selected as active. So if you have three or four in here, you have to make sure you've got the correct one selected, otherwise it will be using the values that are not correct for the calculation. So again, just something that you should be double checking um, to make sure that we've got entered in correctly. So the final thing that we need to ensure is correctly selected is the instrument performance model or IPM. And the selected IPM is used by WellSeeker to generate the ellipse of uncertainty, so it's very important that this is correctly selected, as the different error models can have quite a significantly different output. So for plans, we select our IPM in the Plan Properties dialog, and the IPM is just selected from the drop-down menu in here, so you select the appropriate IPM. And 
for surveys, if we just access the actual wellbore properties, you can see that the IPMs are displayed in the same place. So they're displayed in the survey program, but you cannot select them in here. They're greyed out. So for the surveys, it's slightly different. They're actually selected at the actual survey level itself. So if we go in here in the survey properties, we can see from we can now select from the same drop down menu. So if you're ever in a situation, you need to change the survey instrument to the IPM model for any given survey. You would not do it in the same place um, for the surveys as you would for the plan. You have to remember that. So if you go in and look at the survey properties that, uh, table, uh, they will not be available from the drop down. You have to come into the surveys themselves individually. Now these IPMs that come as standard with the software, um, these have all been created in line with the Industry Steering Committee Wilbur Survey Accuracy Guidelines. So uh, these have all been um, created in line with the, the industry body uh, recommendation and guidelines. So uh, we have a selection available as standard within the software, but there is also the ability to create your own and to pull in additional IPM files um, from other software if you have them. So if we take a look at our survey tool editor now, then this can be accessed via the tools menu, survey tool editor, or it can be accessed at the survey or the plan level um, where you would select your survey instruments. There is an option here for survey tools. And when you select that, it will also open the survey tool editor. So the first thing to point out here, and this is just because this is a mistake that we've seen quite a few times in the past. When you are choosing your survey instrument for a survey or for the plan, you would do that via the drop down menu. You do not do it via this survey tools option. All that this does is it opens up the survey tool editor and allows you to see your available survey tools and the relevant coefficients that are used um, for actually making these up. A, a few times we've seen people coming in here, selecting what they think is the instrument performance model that they're going to be using. They hit apply, they hit cancel, they come out of it, and they realize that it's not actually selected correctly for them in this instrument uh, survey instrument section here. So first thing to be aware of is, Remember to choose your IPM from this drop down list and not through the survey tools themselves, survey tool editor itself. But if we take a look at the survey tool editor, um, there are a few things that are worth pointing out in here. So as I've just mentioned, this particular dialogue just allows you as a user to come along here, select a particular IPM and you can then see the coefficients that have gone into making this up. Now, for some people, this will be completely meaningless, and to other people who have a lot of knowledge of this, this is information that they may require. So this is where you would find that initially. The next thing to mention about the survey tool editor is, is that we have an option here for selecting a default survey tool. Now, in my case, I have this selected as our MWD. If I just select a different error model here, you can see it's not checked. So there's only going to be one of these checked as um, your default. And what this means is that if you forget to assign an instrument performance model to a plan or to a survey, and then you go to run an anti-collision scan or you open up one of the charts that requires an anti-collision calculation to run in the background, the program will warn you that there is a plan or a survey that's missing an IPM and it will tell you that it's going to assign the default. So in this case, it will assign the default of MWD, and that will allow me to um, continue and run the scan. You can, of course, select this to something that's going to give you some bigger errors like blind or unknown. Um, but the reality is, is that any time you see that option flagging up to say that they're using the default survey tool, that should be a warning that you should go back and find the relevant planner survey and assign the correct model because although this may be the correct model, there's a high chance it's not. And as a result, your anti-collision scans will not be accurate. So um, that's the first thing. 
um, go in here and select the relevant default but if you're in a situation that you run the scan and, and it flags up you should go back and make the relevant adjustment the next option that's worth pointing out in here is that we have a, a checkbox that says inclination only wells display vertical so if I close this and we go and we take a look at an inclination only well we'll open up the survey and if I right click here and go to properties we can see the survey instrument that I have selected here is inclination only so the surveys that I've received from this will have an inclination but will have no azimuth but within the software we have to assign an azimuth to this so in my case because I don't know, I've just left them as zero, but I have to put something in. Now, if I look at my section view chart, we can see that it's just ignored those azimuths and it has just plotted this as a purely vertical well. If I go into my survey tool editor and I uncheck this option and hit apply, if I then open up my section view chart, we can see that it has taken the azimuth into consideration and it has plotted this with the inclination and the azimuth. So <clears throat> be aware when you use the inclination only error model, um, sometimes if you open up a chart and it's not displaying exactly the way that you expect it to, it may be because you have either this option checked or unchecked so you can go in here and make the necessary change it's definitely worth pointing out that from the help menu there is a open documentation folder option and within here we have a guide specifically relating to the inclination on the IPM so if this is something you're interested in finding out a little bit more about this is definitely worth taking a look at So if we go back into here again, uh, I mentioned previously that although we do come with a lot of uh, error models um, IPM files included, some users may require to enter their own or create their own and they can do that by selecting the create new option. It will give you the ability to then enter a file name and save it in the IPM folder and once you've done that it will then be available for you to select from this drop down menu and once you've done that you can select the edit and it will allow you to go in here and to edit the relevant coefficients as required now this is not something that we would recommend for most people you have to have a really good knowledge of what you're doing to, in order to be able to build this so uh, the options here but for most people this is not something that you would do in many cases um, if you're working with a, a gyro company, for example, and they have their own specific instrument performance model, instead of providing you with the coefficients, they are likely to provide you with a, a physically an IPM file that you can actually use um, without having to go in here and create all this information. And the way that we would do that is if you go to the help menu and go to the open setup file folder, Within here, there is a folder called IPM, and this folder contains all of the IPM files that you can see from your drop down menu. So, if your gyro company supplies you with the relevant IPM file, you drop that into here, and once you've dropped it into here, you would close Wellseeker, restart Wellseeker, and then when you come in, it will then be available to, for you to select from this drop down menu. The final thing that I want to mention with regards to instrument performance models is that within the software we have the ability to import Compass EDM files and within a Compass EDM file it will contain all of the relevant instrument performance models that are referenced for all the wells that are in that particular export. As a user you have the option to import those IPM files as well. Now a lot of the time the IPM files are actually the same as the ones within the software but maybe the naming convention is different. Uh, 
uh, but you can't guarantee that. Maybe there are some of the coefficients that are slightly been changed. So if you want to make sure you have the same IPMs as within the compass export file, you select this checkbox and it will import the survey tools. And those survey tools, once imported, will be saved to the folder that I've just shown you. And then they will be available immediately from the drop down menu for you to select. They will already be assigned to the relevant plans and surveys that you've pulled in, but they will also be available for you to select at any time as well. So uh, if you don't want to pull those in, just uncheck this option. And when you do import the compass export file, it won't bring those IPM files in. So I've gone through all the inputs and settings within WellSeeker that affect the anti-collision outputs. And it's important to remember that the output is only as good as the input. So it's vital that the things I've discussed so far are entered correctly to ensure you get a meaningful anti-collision output. When comparing the anti-collision outputs from WellSeeker against those from other programs, it's essential to ensure that the setup is in both of these programs is identical. Any differences in the setup in either program will have an effect on the output and may adversely affect the comparison. We're now going to take a look at some of the anti-collision outputs available within WellSeeker. So the first thing that we're going to take a look at is the anti-collision settings. Now the anti-collision settings can be accessed via the tools menu by selecting tools, anti-collision settings, or we can also select this shortcut on the toolbar. And when we select this, it will open up our anti-collision settings dialog. Now the options available to us here when we fill these in and select them, these will have a direct effect on the report manager and also on the travelling cylinder plot as well. Uh, and I'm just going to go through these from top to bottom. So the first section here uh, relates to interpolation. And in the report manager, which we'll look at um, once we finish going through this, there is a section that specifically relates to uh, interpolation. And this is when we print off a report we have the ability to select the interpolate interval. So this here will give us a, uh, an interpolated point every uh, 50 feet. And we can select a depth interval. So this will limit our scan from the whole plan to, in this case, say between three and 500 feet. We're not gonna have that selected at the moment. We can also select to include final station and station. So if the stations do not land exactly on the interpolated point interval, so in this case every exactly every 50 feet, then what will happen is, is the actual points within a plan or a survey will not be included. We can however select to include the final station and to include the stations so that even although it includes interpolated intervals every, in our example, 50 feet, it will also include any points that fall out with this 50 foot uh, interpolated interval. Now, what this allows us to do is, this can be manually changed in the report um, manager dialogue itself, but if you're doing lots of iterations and you're in and out and you're doing a lot of work on the anti-collision at one go, setting this up the way that you want it here means that every time you open the, the dialogue, you don't have to type the values in again. They don't reset. So this can be very useful uh, at times when you are making some adjustments and then running the calculations again. So that's the top section. The next section is for limiting anti-collision results. So we have three options here and they are accessed via these check buttons. So if it's checked, then it's effectively active and it will be factored into the calculation. So we can select a limit for the center to center distance, the separation factor, and also the ellipse separation. So you could select um, center to center distance of, for example, a thousand feet, and anything that falls out with that thousand foot center to center distance will not be included within the scan and the calculation. Um, and again, the same for the separation factor and the ellipse separation. And then down the bottom, <clears throat> we have our anti collision results. So the top option gives us the ability to either have no sort center to center distance, ellipse separation, or separation factor. Within our anti-collision report, there is a section that has the uh, anti-collision summary. And 
the anti-collision summary uh, just gives us the closest centre to centre distance, ellipse separation and separation factor against all of the offset wells. And this just allows us to sort it. So uh, the default is no sort, but if you want to, you can have it so that it will give you the centre to centre distances from the lowest to the highest or any of these other options. So that's all that this option uh, affects. The last option in this dialog is the default travelling cylinder. So this again specifically relates to the travelling cylinder plot and it means that when you open the travelling cylinder plot every time you do it will either be referenced to north or it will be referenced to high side. Now you can adjust that within the plots when you open them and you can do that manually but if you always want the same uh, reference then this is the place to select it because it just means then that every time you open that plot it will be referenced to either north or to high side. And once you've made the relevant selections that you want to in here, you just hit OK and the programme will remember those. Now before we can use any of the anti-collision features we actually need to ensure that we have at least one offset well selected because if we try to run an anti-collision scan or open up any of the plots that run the scan as part of the, uh, the, the values that are displayed within the charts themselves it will flag up an error to tell us that there are no offset wells. So for example if I was to open up the separation factor plot um, here it's opened up without any problems because we have some offset wells. If I unselect all of these, hit apply, and open it up again, no offset wells selected. So it's just giving us the warning. So the first thing we need to do is select our offset wells. And to do that, we select tools and we go to our offset selector. Now again, that can also be selected via the shortcut um, toolbar along the top. So when we open this up, it's going to give us our database tree of all the wells that we are able to select. And we have the ability to, to filter this out down here so we can say that we want to include non-principal plans or we want to include plans or we want to include surveys. So in this case, we've just got that we want to include plans. Actual well bores will be included in here, not to be confused with surveys. So actual well bores are made up of your surveys. Um, they will always be selected as an option by default. Um, but if you want to access the surveys that make up these, then that's what you would select here. So in this case, we've got a few offset wells and we can go through them and we can manually check them. Or, if we wanted to and we knew what we were doing, we knew we wanted them all, you could uh, select all or unselect all. It's entirely up to you. Um, and if you hit the update option once you've selected them, this will tell you the number of offset wells that you've got selected. So in our case, we have selected five. There is also the global scan method where you can put in a, a, a distance in terms of the number of miles or the number of kilometres, depending on the units selected. And once you do that, if you hit select, it will automatically go through all the available wells and it will choose those that are within a 10 mile radius or a 1 mile radius. And it will also, uh, it will check them in here and it will tell you how many you've got selected. But in our case, we've selected a few offset wells. We're just going to hit apply and they've now been selected. So when we start to look at the, um, the plots and the reports, we won't have any problems. It is really important to remember though that if you don't have an offset well selected then you obviously can't scan against it and it's never going to flag up as a problem. So it's very very important that you make sure that all of the offset wells that you need to have selected are selected. If you have one missing it could be an important one and you could have no issues on your anti-collision scan only because you've missed out a well. So again it can't be uh, underestimated or overemphasized the fact that for your offsets you have to make sure you select all of the relevant wells that you need to scan against. So we'll now take a look at the anti-collision reports and these are accessed um, via the reports menu. Now this reports menu is only going to be available to you if you have a plan or a survey open. 
it's not going to be there if it's not. So the first thing you need to understand is you obviously need to be in a plan or a survey and have your offset wells and selected. You then go to report and in our case we want to select anti-collision report. And this opens up the report dialog, the report manager dialog. And we have one anti-collision report option. It is possible to um, create new anti-collision reports by hitting the um, new uh, AC report, which will then create a new template and you can then go and you can rename it and make the relevant adjustments uh, as you wish. But for us, we'll just look at the standard report that we have. These can be output as PDF or Excel or Text Tab Delimited from the drop down menu. And then these two options here for the report columns and the report options just allow you as a user to uh, tailor and customize your report to include or exclude information that you want to want to have there or, or obviously want to omit. Um, so in our case, all of these options are checked for the report columns. And for the report option, most of these are selected as well. So depending on the type of report, you know, there's a difference between the anti-collision report and survey reports and error ellipse reports in terms of some of the options that are available here. So we can see we've got our AC summary, AC settings, offset survey programs. These are all um, very much specific to the anti-collision reports. So you check what ones you want. And if you want something selected all the time, for example, this sign off section, let's say we, we could check this, print off a report. If we close the dialog and reopened it, this would still be unchecked. But if you want this now checked all the time, you check it and then hit apply and it will say template saved. So the next time you come in to generate an anti-collision report, this option will now be checked as standard. So these are the options here available to us. So in our case, we'll just check everything. Down the left hand side at the bottom, we have our interpolate section. Now we talked about this within the anti-collision settings option, and we can see here that the interval is entered in here as 50, and we have got the include final stations and include stations checked. Now the reason that these are checked is because we have them selected in our anti-collision settings. If I went through to the anti-collision settings and unchecked those, none of these boxes would be checked. And every time I come in here, I would need to check these. This, as I mentioned before, can just make your life a little bit easier to stop you having to continually do something, especially if you're running the calculations over intervals, because every time that you run the report and then you close this, when you open it up again, it will reset. But if you've got it selected in anti-collision settings, it will give you the same thing every time. And of course, you can still make the adjustments here. Uh, we could change this to 100, for example. Um, but in our case, uh, you know, we'll just leave it um, as it was per the default at 50. The whole path option down here just allows you that if you've got a sidetrack, it will include the motherboard as part of the scan as well. And the bottom left hand side of the report manager dialog also gives us the option as to whether we want to include separation factor plot and ladder plot uh, in our report and these will be right at the very end so if i now just hit create this is going to create a pdf report for us and if we go up to the top it's going to give us all the relevant sections and information that we've got selected, things that are important for anti-collision. For example, here's our sigma values for our error outputs. We can see we've got the scan method, we've got the error surface, are we including casings? If we have got a horizontal or vertical uncertainty at the facility or well level, these will be referenced here as well. And then as we scan down, we've got our AC summary. So again, I mentioned within the um, anti-collision settings that we have the ability to um, select how we wanted to sort these results. So we have no sort at the moment, but and because we've got no sort selected, all it does is it groups 
um, the various warnings per well. So here we've got the centre to centre, ellipse separation, and separation factor, minimum values for 2H and then 3H, 4H, etc. If we group this for centre to centre, it would take the smallest centre to centre distance and then list them from smallest to largest and the same for these other options here. Scroll down, we've got our anti-collision settings and we've got the information relating to our offset well survey programme. Specifically for 2H. And this gives us a breakdown every 50 foot against 2H. And if we keep scrolling, we will come to the next well, 3H. And this gives us again the offset survey programme that's been used to make... Um, with the IPMs used for this offset well, and then it gives us our breakdown against it. We can also see down the right hand side here in the warnings column that um, any warning that's being flagged will be displayed on here. So for example, we have a separation factor here which is below one, it's being flagged as a level three warning. And then up here we have one that is between 1.5 and one, is being flagged as a level two. So again, within the anti-collision report, where we entered um, our information at the very beginning in the operator level of the database tree, where we selected our warning values, this is where they're now going to be displayed uh, for us to see whether there's any potential issues that will be flagged up on the right hand side in here. So in addition to the anti-collision report, we have got three plots which are related to anti-collision. We have got our travelling cylinder, our separation factor plot and our ladder plot. These are also accessible from the shortcut buttons on the toolbar. So if we just take a look at our separation factor plot to begin with. So what this does is it plots the separation factor against all of our offset wells on this chart and we can see we've got again level one two and three so these are the values again that i've just shown you and these are now being visually represented on this chart by a horizontal line so anything that dips below these warning levels is something that we need to take a look at in a bit more detail when you open this chart it will always open with uh, values between 0 and 10 on the y-axis for the separation factor and that's because generally anything bigger than 10 we're not going to be worried too much about. We don't want the chart to open up with huge values up here because at least with 0 to 10 we have a fairly good scale that we can clearly see where our lines are. If however you want to increase this scale you can do this by double left clicking on the plot and then in the chart grid for the y we can select this option here, change it to, for example, 20, hit OK, and we can now see that it has changed here. So we can see we've got an additional well on here that wasn't displaying before. Um, and yeah, you can, you can set this up whatever way that you want it to be. If you want to put a legend on, again, you can double left click in the chart properties, and we have a um, legend option here, which is selected as hide at the moment. We can select this as, for example, top. And that will obviously show us our legend at the top. We can also, by double left clicking on the chart, we could also put the well names on here as well. And those well names will show up and we can drag those for each of the relevant wells to show us a little bit more clearly what is our what particular wells of interest. If we now take a look at the ladder plot, so the ladder plot is going to plot the centre to centre distance against all the offset wells against our measured depth. And we can zoom in on this by using the scroll button on our mouse, and then we can left click and drag. And this just allows us to then zoom in, and we can grab and drag, we can use our left and our right arrow keys on our keyboard to move left and right. Or we can grab the bottom and we can zoom along this bar here. And this just allows us to see at any given measure depth how far away are each of these 
offset wells. So we'll now take a look at the travelling cylinder plot. So this is the travelling cylinder plot and there are quite a number of things that need to be considered when dealing with the travelling cylinder plot. The first point and probably one of the main things that we need to remember and it was something that we discussed at the very beginning of this video is the scan method used when um, opening and using the travelling cylinder plot. And we can look at the scan method um, in the operator level within the anti-collision settings. So we mentioned before that in order to properly use the travelling cylinder plot, you have to select the method as either travelling cylinder or travelling cylinder north, depending on what you're referencing, if it's high side or if it's north. In our case, we are currently referencing 3D closest approach method, and you can see that it still generates a plot and it still generates lines on this plot. But doing it this way is not the correct way to do it. You really need to make sure that you have these selected. So that's why it's so important that you're very aware of this because even though this is not the correct scan method to be used, you will still get an output. And the big difference between the 3D closest approach and the travelling cylinder is, is that the 3D closest approach scans all the way down the reference well against the offset wells whereas the travelling cylinder scans down all the offset wells against the reference. So in this case, we can see that this is a north reference uh, tool face travelling cylinder. So in order to make this display correctly, we need to select the travelling cylinder north. So if I select travelling cylinder north and hit apply, immediately we can see that there is some fairly big changes in terms of the lines that have been displayed. So first, and most important thing, make sure that your scan method is correct. So here we've now got that correctly selected. We hit apply and we hit close. So one of the big things about the travelling cylinder plot is that quite often we don't want to look at the whole um, well when we're looking at this. We want to narrow it down to a smaller interval than the entire plan or the entire survey, whatever we're being referenced. And we can do that um, via the anti-collision settings, which we mentioned before. So we mentioned that the interpolate option uh, doesn't just affect the report manager um, dialog, it also affects the travelling cylinder. So here we have selected an interval, and this interval is every 50 foot, and that's what will be used here. We can also select to narrow down our depth range. Now, I'm going to come back and do that because I want to show you a few things before that. But this is quite important and will be useful for you. So... We will come back to this uh, in a moment. We want now to um, zoom in on this particular uh, plot and we'll do that by left clicking and dragging. So unlike some of the other plots where you use the scroll button on your mouse, we're going to left click and drag. And we're going to do that until we get to um, a, a radius that we are happy with. So here we've got um, every 20 feet, we've got up to a radius of about um, 90. And if I just come in here and we'll just change these grid lines to black to begin with, so they're a little bit clearer. So we've got quite a good, um, we've got quite a good scale now. And what we can do now is we can turn on our ellipses. So it, we can do that by selecting uh, show error ellipses up the top. And the errors are now going to display and these will display on the offset well. So as we mentioned before, we have an ellipse of uncertainty associated with the reference and with the offset. And specifically for the travelling cylinder plot, these get added together and they get displayed on the uh, offset wells to effectively show the no-go zone at any given depth. So that's the first thing that we can see. What we can do here is, if we double left click on the plot, we can help to make these a little bit clearer by selecting in the uh, error ellipses that the errors are the same colour as the series. And if we do that, we can now have a little bit clearer indication as to what ellipses um, are relevant to what line. Um, because as we can see here, when they, especially when the lines cross over, it can be a little bit more difficult to see. The other thing that we will want to do here is we will want to um, 
basically we have points every 50 feet which we have selected from our anti-collision settings we now want to um, display an ellipse every 50 foot and in order to do that we go back into our chart properties and we select our frequency to one so instead of displaying at five it would display an ellipse every five points or every fifth point specifically now it's going to display an ellipse every uh, at a frequency of one so we're now going to get an ellipse every 50 feet and we can see that we've now got a higher concentration of ellipses that are being displayed on here. Something that you'll notice is that this red line that we can see here doesn't have any ellipses generated on it at all. And that is because this is the survey, just to show you if we put on the, um, the well names, this is the, um, the survey that is associated with our plan. So it's underneath the same well. And we don't want to see our ellipses of uncertainty on this because effectively we want to be on top of this. There's no no-go zone for this. The closer we are, the better. But if we go back into our chart properties, we can see that there's an option for the traveling cylinder reference that says show errors on reference well. If I check this and I hit OK, we are now going to get the ellipses drawn on our um, on our survey, and you can see that this just there's just too much going on here, um, so that's the main reason why we would not display those. So I'm just going to get rid of those now by unchecking this, and it just makes life and things an awful lot clearer. While I'm in here, um, I will just show you, I mentioned before about how we can have different references in terms of north or high side. Now, we had selected north as our default, but when you're in the chart, you can change this to high side. And if we change it to high side, you can see that it will generate these lines and put them in different positions. Now, in order for this to be correct, we would then have to go back in here and we would have to change... Uh, within the properties of the operator, we would then have to change the scan method here to travelling cylinder. Um, in our case, we don't want to do that. We just want to keep it referenced to north. So I will select north here and we'll put it back. But just remember, if at any time, for whatever reason, you need to change it, you can do that in this section here. The next thing that we're going to look at here is... As I mentioned before, this is our offset wells displayed across the their entire length. And in this case, again, we want to narrow this down a little bit. And in order to do that, we are going to go into our anti-collision settings. And in here, we're now going to select the depth and we're going to limit this depth between 300 and 500 feet measured depth. If I hit OK, we can see this significantly reduced the amount of things that are going on in our chart and it makes it a little bit clearer and easier for us to work with. We'll now also put on some depth labels and this is going to be for measure depth opposed to TVD and we can now set our label interval and in this particular example I'm going to set, select the label interval for every 50 foot, which is the same as that we had selected for our anti-collision settings. So I hit OK. What this means is that we're now going to end up with a label for each of our ellipses, because effectively the ellipses are going to be generated every 50 foot, and so are our labels. And if we zoom in here, we can see our labels being displayed, and we can manipulate these as required. And you can zoom in a bit further than this if you want. Obviously the further you zoom in the clearer it will be. So we can now see we've got our depth labels, we've got our no-go lines and I mentioned earlier that um, about the travelling cylinder plot safety factor and that is accessed via the operator level by right-clicking going to properties and in the anti-collision settings uh, we have this down at the very bottom so at the moment it's set to one 
If I set this to 1.2 and hit apply, if we look at the size of our ellipses, they increase in size. So what I've done here is by selecting this as 1.2, our um, ellipses of uncertainty and our no-go zone effectively is now 20% larger. And in this case, it's now 50% larger. So that's how you can incorporate this uh, safety factor into the plot. And that now covers our travelling cylinder plot. So that now covers the anti-collision reports and chart outputs. The final thing that I want to introduce is the real-time anti-collision. So the first thing to understand is, is that in order to access the real-time anti-collision, you have to be in a survey and not in a plan. So currently, I'm in a plan, and we can see that our option for real-time anti-collision is greyed out. So if I close this off and I open up my survey now, now I can see that my option for the real-time anti-collision is available for me to select. So it's available from the shortcut toolbar along the top and also from the tools menu, dashboards, real-time anti-collision warnings. And when we select this, it's going to open up the real-time anti-collision dialog. And this dialogue is split up into three different sections. So we'll just start at the top and work our way down. So the first thing that we've got here is our warning levels. And we have four different warning levels within the software that the user can either have enabled or disabled. And then they can select the values that they want within here. So the minimum distance to offset wells. We are currently saying that if we get to within 30 foot of an offset well, we want a warning to be flagged maximum distance from plan so if we are more than 17 feet away from our principal well plan we want this to be flagged within the warning section down here minimum distance to lease line if we are within 40 foot of a lease line we want a warning and then we have our minimum separation um, and in this case if we are less than a separation factor of 1.25 we want to know about it now, one thing to notice is, is that when we open this dialog, the minimum separation factor cell was not checked. And that will always be the case. Even if when you close this, this was enabled, every time you open this, you will always have to come in and, and select the check separation, calculate separation factor. The other options, if you select to um, have them disabled, when you close and reopen it will still be unchecked. Um, but you just have to be aware with the separation fact that every time you open this dialogue, you will have to check this option. Our point of interest is always going to be the last point in the survey listing. Now, that could be a survey um, or it could be a, a projection. Um, either way, this will update automatically as you enter the new values in. And I'll show you in a second um, how that works. The last part within the dialogue is the anti-collision results. Now, if I uncheck the calculate separation factor, notice that we have a few columns that are missing. If this is checked, we get a few extra columns in here. So this, this will not show, um, it will only show the center to center distance, um, the tool face offset high side and north, and the warnings. And down the left hand side here, we have got um, the well plan, so this is the principal plan, which we have selected here. And then we've got three offsets and we have a lease line associated with this. If we have calculate separation factor in here, we get three additional columns, reference ellipse, offset ellipse, and the separation factor. When you open this dialog, um, you can leave this dialog open. So this will stay open. You can put it on a second monitor. You can minimize it, leave it in the back. But the idea is, is that when you're in a situation where you have anti-collision issues or potential anti-collision issues, you would open this up and you just leave it open. So if we look, for example, here, we are currently 16.58 feet away from our principal plan and our maximum distance is set at 17. So we're very close to the limit of getting a warning. So if I just enter in a, a completely false survey here, um, say 850, 71.50. Notice that as I've added this in, as soon as I have added 
the three, uh, measure depth, inclination and the azimuth. The point of interest has updated straight away and that has now updated everything that we're seeing here. So we've now gone from being just under 17 feet to being 85 feet centre to centre distance away from our plan. And as a result, that has flagged up instantly to tell us that it's greater than the maximum distance. Um, again, I mentioned that if you're using a projection, uh, we could, for example, open this projection, append it to the survey. So we can see the projections now come in here and that has updated uh, again the point of interest in here. So um, this will always give us the last point in the survey. And as you're drilling and as you add new surveys and new projections, you'll very quickly be able to see how far away you are and what your separation factor is against the closest point on any of the offset wells, the lease line and the well plan. If I just remove that from the survey there and we'll delete this last line. The only other thing to mention with regards to the real-time anti-collision dialog is there is an option in the files menu to open real-time anti-collision email. And if we select this, what it's going to do is it's going to run or it's going to open an Outlook email which has a few things attached. So as it stands, we have selected to include a PDF survey report and a PDF anti-collision report. And I'll show you some of these options once we've gone through the email. We also, in the body of the email, we have some survey information. So we have our last survey, we have a bit projection, and then we have a 100 foot and a 200 foot projection. This again is based on the setup that we have, which I'll show you in a second. It then goes down through all of our offset wells and it will give us the centre to centre distance and the separation factor at each of these points. So based on the last survey, the projection, the bit, and then the additional 100 and 200 foot projections. And this will then allow you to just put in whatever uh, emails are required and you can send this off very quickly and easily to um, all the relevant people that it needs to go to. In the real-time anti-collision dialogue, we have some options and these options, as I mentioned a moment ago, relate directly to the real-time anti-collision email. So the first thing is, is we have this check to open email. So with this checked, when we select this, it's going to, of course, open the email and it, this will specifically be an Outlook Bit projection on last line, when this is checked, this is telling the program that the, the last line in the survey program as in, in this case uh, 17747 is actually a projection and as such the program will then see the survey on line 44 as the last survey point and it will display this as the bit projection as we saw in the email. If this was unchecked, then there would be no option in there in the email that says bit projection. It would just give us the two other projections. We saw that we had included a survey report as a PDF, but we can select to include it as Excel or text, or you can actually have it so that you include all of them. Same for our anti-collision report as a PDF or an Excel. And then we have four options for straight line projections. So we can go 100, 200 foot, 300 foot or 400 foot. So you can include whichever one of these you require based on, um, on what you're actually doing. So that covers everything related to the real-time anti-collision. That's us now going through the various anti-collision features within Wellseeker. We're now going to take a look at some questions. So I'm going to read through the questions one at a time. Once I've finished reading a question, if you hit pause, try to answer the question yourself, and then when you're ready, hit play and see if your answer matches mine. So question number one. At what level in the database tree do you access the anti-collision settings? You can access the anti-collision settings at operator level. Question number two. 
When comparing the anti-collision output from WellSeeker against the output from other programs, what is important to remember? It's important to make sure the setup in both programs is identical to ensure that you have a true like-for-like -like comparison. Question number three. What anti-collision charts are available to view in WellSeeker? The three charts are the separation factor plot, the ladder plot and the travelling cylinder plot. Question number four. Can you access the real-time anti-collision feature when the selected reference is a plan? No, the real-time anti-collision dialogue can only be accessed when in a survey. So now we'll take a look at the end of video exercise. So for our exercise, we would be looking for you to create a database with a reference well and at least one offset well and have a play with the various anti-collision features within the software. You could, if you have one available, obviously import a compass export file, but if not, then you can build the, the reference and the offset wells uh, manually. And of course, if at any point you become stuck, refer back to the video for a refresher. This now concludes our Wellseeker introduction to anti-collision training video.